Okay. This is going to be a treat. Um, welcome to our keynote Q&A discussion with David Hirsch. Uh, for those of you who do not know, David is the chief of the SEC's crypto assets and cyber unit. He is a busy man, and we're really glad that he decided to join us today. Uh, the crypto assets and cyber unit is a specialized unit at the SEC that focuses on crypto assets and decentralized finance, cybersecurity related internal controls of regulated entities, issuer disclosure of cyber security risks and events, cyber related trading schemes, and dark web related conduct. And as chief, David leads a team of more than 50 professionals, including attorneys, accountants, and other specialists such as data scientists. Uh, previously, David served as counsel to SEC Commissioner Carolyn Crenshaw, uh, where he was primarily responsible for matters related to enforcement along with crypto assets and cybersecurity, and also as a, a counsel in, in the Division of Enforcement, where he was a member of the SEC Digital Ledger Technology Working Group and the Dark Web Working Group, which I never even knew was a thing, but it is. So David, welcome and thanks for coming to Chicago. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Um, this is a particularly interesting panel because the moderator today is Christy Littman. Uh, she is now a partner in the litigation department at Wilkie and co-head of its digital works practice. Um, as part of her enforcement practice, she often represents clients on cryptocurrency and digital assets regulation and cybersecurity matters, um, including investigations and enforcement actions by financial regulators. And the reason that she does that is, as many of you know, she was David's predecessor as chief of the crypto assets and cyber unit in the enforcement division. So this will be a fantastic discussion. Um, Christy also served for 12 years at, at the SEC in a variety of, of senior positions, including senior advisor to SEC Chairman Jay Clayton on enforcement matters. But Christy, uh, we're lo really looking forward to the discussion and thank you for moderating. Take it away. Thanks, Bruce. Um, thank you, Bruce. Thank you all for being here. So as, as Bruce said, you're a very busy man. Um, the unit is firing on all cylinders, bringing a lot of cases, keeping Bruce's newsletter alive, um, keeping my practice alive. Do you want to start by just kind of talking generally about the unit's priorities and the commission's priorities right now in this space? Sure. I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for the opportunity to be here today. I'm here in my uh, official capacity, although the views I share are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the commission, the commissioners, or fellow staff. So with that out of the way, you know, I, the commission has been very active in this space, uh, I think largely because we've seen a lot of risk and a lot of harm to investors. Um, we've seen huge amounts of money uh, disappear or be vaporized overnight uh, in ways that were surprising to investors and risked market contagion, at least within the, the crypto markets more generally. And as a result, uh, we have continued uh, the kind of fine practice that Christy led before and, and Rob Cohen before her to try and be as active as we can to bring some additional clarity to this space, to continue to emphasize the need for registration, for disclosure, for best practices and to continue our anti-fraud mission. Uh, so I would anticipate that we are going to continue to see much of the same that we have, uh, you know, very active, going to continue to look at registration violations both by issuers, and that can be tokens, it can be NFTs, it can be anything else that is uh, classified as a security. Um, and also we're going to continue to be active as to intermediaries, and that can be brokers, dealers, exchanges, clearing agencies, or, or any others who are active in this space, are within our jurisdiction and not meeting their obligations, either through registration or failure to provide adequate or complete disclosures. Great. So I want to follow up on a, a few of the categories that you mentioned. Helpfully, the prior panel, Lara and Kristen, went over Howie and Reeves, and that was really kind of, Howie was really the case that we all looked at, right? When the commission put out its digital asset framework, it's, it's based entirely around Howie. We brought some cases when I was there under Reeves, um, including the crypto lending cases. But there is a new legal theory <laughs> that I noticed in the Terra Labs case, which is, you know, for, and I think as Lara covered in, in her portion of the prior panel, 
these, you know, what is a security is defined by Section 2A of the Securities Act, and it has this kind of like laundry list of assets. Equities are obviously securities. Um, and then Howey defines what an investment contract is, which is one of the enumerated categories. But in the UST, Terra, the, it's the Terraform Labs, Doquan uh, action where the SEC charges that UST, which was their stable coin, turned out not to be so stable, um, it charges UST as a, a security under Howey, but also under this part of the of, of Section 2A that says that because it was a right to subscribe or purchase another security, that it is it is considered a security. That's one I don't think we've ever seen. We've never seen it in a crypto case before. I'm not sure that the SEC has used that in any action it's brought. Um, and obviously, I know you, Tara's pending litigation. You can't talk about that case. Um, but you know, for us in private practice, our cons our clients are constantly trying to like issue site and and see what the next <laughs> what the next big legal theory is going to be. So, are there other other than Howie Reeves and and this new um, piece of two A? Are there other theories we should be thinking about, worrying about? <clears throat> I don't know that there are other theories that I'm uh, in a position to talk about today or any that are, that are imminent on the horizon. So we'll be reading about them next week. <laughs> it is September. It is September. But uh, no, I mean, I think that as different assets start to make their way into the crypto space, there's a lot of energy and time and money being devoted to methods of tokenizing other types of assets, bringing real world assets onto DeFi. So I think that everyone in the space should continue to really be thinking very much about the substance of what is at issue in transactions. And if what is being offered and sold is, is a security, whether that's under Howey, Reeves, uh, kind of the, the right to redeem, or, or because it looks more like a traditional uh, security bond or option, like the, the ultimate focus should remain on the substance of the transaction rather than what, on what it is labeled. Another legal theory that I, I get questions about a lot from clients is the statutory underwriter theory. This is something that, I mean, the Telegram opinion, which was an early win for the SEC, had to Blair and I work that case together. Um, <laughs> that the opinion had pretty specific language implying that you know all of the, and, and in that case it was all institutional purchasers, could be deemed statutory underwriters and thus have statutory underwriter liability. Um, although I will note in that case, the you know that well, that was a TRO to prevent the issuance of the grams, so they couldn't have been resold by statutory underwriters. But you know the the SEC thus far has not gone after those institutional investors. I have a lot of clients who are in that situation, want to know if if there's potential for it. There has been a recent case. It's outside of the unit, but coordinated closely, I'm sure, with the unit uh, in the Sparkster matter. The Sparkster coin piece of it was settled, but there was a charge against an individual named Ian Bellina, who was like one of these promoters who bought up a bunch of tokens and created a pool and then sold opportunities to other investors to buy from that pool. And the complaint there, while it doesn't articulate a statutory liability, a statutory underwriter theory, it uses the language from the statute that's very similar. It says that he bought those tokens with a view towards distribution. And so he was charged with Section 5 liability also, even though he wasn't the issuer of the token. So statutory, and I'm not asking about that case specifically, because again, it's in litigation. But you know, for the institutional investors out there who do buy these, these tokens in pretty large volume, I mean, is statutory underwriter liability something that they should be worrying about? Uh, yes. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that. that to the extent that the, um, I think it's section 2A11 sets out the, the rules for statutory underwriter, and if institutional investors or others are buying tokens with, an in, uh, with a view to distribute them, then they are potentially falling within that, that definition. They need to make sure they either satisfy an exemption or they should, should register as such. And I think there was guidance put out by the division of exams back in February 2021 that mentioned the potential for statutory underwriter liability and that expressed an, in, an inclination to, with registrants at least, as part of their exams, to be looking at those amounts of tokens that have been acquired and whether or not there was a potential statutory underwriter uh, issue there. Oh, that's interesting. So I, get, I mean, it sounds like if, if the SEC is going to pursue these cases, what we need to really focus on is what that intent was at the time of purchasing and building out the case that that was, that was not the intent to distribute. 
Um, I want to turn to exchanges, which, again, is honestly, you all are litigating so many cases. I don't know how we can talk today, because you can't talk about active litigation. But there are a number of exchange cases working their way through the courts. And you know, Lara also helpfully covered the Ripple ruling, which is a really interesting read. For If you haven't read it yet, you know, I encourage you to read it. It kind of up is down, black is white. It's, it's very, it, it turns everything I think we all thought about how securities laws apply to the space on its head. Um, the industry celebrated it when it came out. Everyone was very excited. I had a lot of calls from clients who had big plans. Um, and, and you know, what I said to clients was like, look, take a beat. This is, this is probably going to be appealed. There's some areas here that I think are, are vulnerable to appeal. Um, and then, you know, and, and I'll tell you, the reason why people celebrated it, one of the big reasons is there is some specific language in there that says that the programmatic purchasers, so these are the people who bought through an intermediary, are situated similarly to secondary market participants in that they are not engaged in a securities transaction. And so while it's not the actual ruling of the case, it's dicta, and that issue was not before the court in that matter, it was meaningful to people. It's, what it said to people was, oh, secondary market transactions are not securities transactions. So Coinbase wins, Binance wins, right? That was, I think, kind of what the industry took from the ruling, despite it not really actually extending to secondary market transactions. Um, and, and obviously, there, you know, the SEC has filed for an interlocutory appeal in that case. But then just a matter of weeks later, Judge Rakoff came out and immediately threw water on the idea that Judge Torres's ruling was going to withstand appellate scrutiny. And he said, I'm not going to apply that, because I think she got it wrong, which only Judge Rakoff can do. Um, and so my, I guess my question is, you know, I think a lot of people were using that case as you know, some sort of bellwether for how the Coinbase litigation is going to go. People are obviously watching Coinbase and Binance very closely. Um, and, and my question is really kind of, around centralized exchanges generally. The, obviously, you've charged Bixie and, Beatri Bixie and Bitrix as well. But Coinbase and Binance are the big ones. And there are a lot of other centralized exchanges out there that have the exact same business model. And so my question is, are there more? Why these? Why now? You know, what's the kind of the message that we should be taking away from your current posture? Uh, absolutely. So. I mean, you, you've been in this job, so you know we're a little bit constrained about what we can talk about as far as the internal processes and the deliberative process within the SEC, both within the, the unit and division as far as how we decide when to make a recommendation, and then ultimately it's up to the commission as to whether or not to take up that recommendation, when to support it or, or decline it. Um, and so some of that timing is uh, both kind of not something I'm allowed to talk about, and also some that's just outside of my control. But I, I would say, stepping away from speaking specifically about Coinbase and Binance, since they are both in litigation, more generally, I think the types of problems that we identified and the types of concerns that have been discussed by um, Chair Gensler and uh, Director Graywall in the context of our efforts against intermediaries in this space, I think hold true well beyond any two entities. And I think that, you know, there are more tokens extant, I think maybe 20,000, 25,000 last I read, than the SEC or any agency has the resources to pursue directly. And similarly, there are a number of centralized platforms out there, some of that are acting as unregistered exchanges, some that are acting in multiple capacities, as we alleged with Binance and Coinbase, as, as not only unregistered exchanges, but also unregistered brokers, unregistered clearing agencies, uh, I think unregistered dealer charges are possible. And we are going to continue to bring those charges. And when we bring those and against whom is going to be a factor dependent in part on you know, when the investigation is ready, uh, what our resources are, and what other uh, priorities that the, uh, the commission has for us, because we can't devote all our litigation resources into just one, <laughs> one area. And uh, you're right, we do have a lot of litigation going on. Yes, it feels like you're at capacity, but sometimes the government finds a way to stretch that capacity. Um, so keeping on the theme of exchanges, but moving to DeFi, there, you know, I know that when I was still there, we brought the DeFi money market case, but that's for like DeFi, right? That was DeFi in name only. It, it didn't really even purport to be a decentralized product. Um, 
And then the, the SEC, since I left, has brought the case against um, Eisenberg in the Mango Markets case, but didn't charge Mango Markets, um, which was the, the platform there. But in that case, did talk a little bit about governance tokens. And so these are tokens, for those of you who don't know, that are, um, you know, it's a, you own the token, you can, you can trade it on the secondary market like, like other tokens, but it also vests you with some sort of voting right usually, so that if a change to the protocol is going to be made, you may have an opportunity to vote on whether to approve that change to the protocol. And in that complaint, there is a section titled the illusory rights of governance tokens or something to that effect. And it you know, kind of lays out this idea that there were no real rights at all, right? That, that the control in that particular platform is entirely centralized and, and not diffuse as, as they claimed it to be. Um, so it's clear how the SEC feels about DeFi. And we've heard, I mean, Chair Gensler talks about it all the time. Um, but we haven't seen like, a true DeFi case against a DeFi entity yet. I think that's a, likely a matter of time. Like, as in, as in the, the Mango Markets case, which I believe uh, Kristen worked on uh, excellently, uh, and, in, and that's also a litigation, so we're limited in what we can say about that one specifically. But with DeFi, as with everything, what you call something is not controlling from the perspective of the SEC. It really goes to the function and the substance. And as we alleged in, in that case, as we've talked about in other contexts, if the idea is that you're seeking to avoid um, liability or accountability by dressing yourself in a new technology, but the substance of what you're doing is, is similar to the things that are already under our jurisdiction pursuant to the securities laws, then we're going to continue to use those securities laws to bring enforcement actions as appropriate. And so we're going to continue to conduct investigations. We're going to be active in the space. And, Adding the label of DeFi is not going to be something that's going to deter us from continuing our work. And so uh, you know, to the extent that there is no attribution to be had, that no individual controlled anything in a way that is demonstrable and provable, then that may have an impact. But um, I would argue that that is not consistently the case throughout DeFi. Understood. So this may be an area where we see them stretching these litigation resources again. I can't imagine one of those settling, but maybe, you know, perhaps we'll see soon. Um, there was a, a, were a number of DeFi settlements out of the CFTC recently uh, relating to DeFi platform, or I should say platforms that offered some DeFi component, but, but also some, you know, more centralized components relating to futures and the like. Um, is this an example of kind of like dividing up labor between the SEC and the CFTC? I mean, how, how are you thinking about it? How are you approaching that um, coordination with the CFTC to say, you know, look, this is in your lane, this is in my lane? So uh, without specific attribution or, or association with those particular right. recent actions, I mean, generally, my view is that uh, crypto enforcement is a team sport by definition. There's just more activity out there than any one agency has the resources to individually pursue. And so by definition, we have to be working with our law enforcement partners, including civil law enforcement like the CFTC, but also criminal law enforcement, as well as state regulators around the country, that there is just so much activity that needs to be looked at. We really have to be sensible about how we define our priorities and how we share uh, that responsibility of pursuing those. And so there, I expect there will continue to be cases where we and the CFTC are both on the scene because we have our independent jurisdictional prerogatives that we have to advance. But I think there are going to continue to also be matters where we say that ultimately the result we need, which is either registration, notice to investors and markets about problems, uh, enforcement and deterrence, can be accomplished by one agency without necessarily having both agencies involved. And so where necessary, we'll both be there. And there'll be times where it'll be just one agency or, or the other. And I would not necessarily take from any individual action or even small group of actions like a larger message about where our priorities are. A lot of times when you're looking at those small sample signs, it's really just facts and circumstances of those specific issues. Great. So I want to talk a little bit about NFTs. The last panel covered. Um, impact theory and stoner cats in depth um, and, and kind of the charges and the resolution there. But, you know, there are a lot of NFT projects and there's been some press coverage of other investigations. Um, and I think there is kind of a, a sentiment in the market that 
you know, even though these two were determined by the SEC to be securities offerings, that a lot of NFTs are very differently situated. And so I'm interested to hear whether, whether you would agree with that sentiment that there, there are likely NFTs out there that don't meet the Howey test. I, I'm sure there are. Um. <laughs> Can't think of any. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, NFTs uh, as a technology has been advertised, if not necessarily as it's always been deployed, suggests that it is as much um, a, a license or a personal signifier or identifier as it is a means of generating profits. And so for us, and in those two cases, we pursued them under the, the Howey theory, uh, establishing our jurisdiction. I mean, if the creators of the NFTs can demonstrate that the mechanism that they're employing is designed to provide a, a feature to a specific user but isn't intended to generate profits for anyone, then we don't have likely Howie, and therefore that's not an SEC jurisdiction responsibility. So it's really about whether or not there's a profit motive supporting the distribution or, or uh, kind of interest in the specific product. And, and that extends beyond NFTs to lots of other kind of crypto generally. That if you look at a lot of the crypto pro projects, I would say the majority, if not the great majority, if you remove the profit motive, it's not clear to me that the product on its own stands, that a lot of what is driving the at least development of the industry as it exists now is trying to incentivize early adoption by people thinking that by getting there early, they can drift off of the efforts of the promoters to make this thing capable of mass adoption, and their scarcity will create opportunities for profits as the value of what they acquire or goes up. And if that's true, whether it's NFTs, crypto, or something else, then they may well have a Howie issue. Nobody wants to miss out on the next Bitcoin, um, <clears throat> which was a good segue, a good accidental segue <laughs> to the subject of touting. I think, you know, um, names like Stoner Cats are very memorable, but also very high. The other names that grab attention are Kim Kardashian. And I think, you know, my sitting on the outside, if you don't read crypto Twitter yet, do not start. <laughs> but when the, when the Kim Kardashian case came out, there was a lot of kind of, you know, there's always a lot of criticism of the SEC on Twitter, but there was a lot that was like, come on, there's real, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff happening in crypto. Why are you going after Kim Kardashian? Um, and in my view, kind of misses the point why, why touting cases are important. And I know, you know, Steph and Steve put out a statement on it when they were the directors, but can you talk to us a little bit about like why these touting cases, um, even though, you know, I mean, I think people know like Kim Kardashian is, is compensated for this stuff, but why, it, why it's so important to the program's larger kind of mission. Yeah, and I, I would uh, recommend people to read some of uh, Director Graywall's recent speeches on this topic, that he has been very active and outspoken about the idea that a lot of crypto has been marketed to investors who are um, both uh, less financially educated and less able to withstand losses. And that in particular, there's been a drive to sell crypto in minority and underserved communities to people who, um, can least afford to withstand those losses and, and have least of the alternative opportunities to choose from. And so touting in particular seems like it is directly focused at those audiences, at a younger group of investors, at maybe a less affluent group of investors and folks who can least withstand uh, losses as a result of poor investment choices they might make. And so it's extra important for those people who are reaching out to those market, uh, markets who are likely going to be market, selling to those markets to be really clear about if they have spokespeople out there, if, if the people are out there doing the touting, that they are compliant with their obligations to be explicit about the fact that they're being compensated, the amount of the compensation, and who that compensation is coming from. I think it is easy for people to get caught up in hype in crypto as much as any place, or maybe even more so than other places. It moves very quickly. There's a ton of volatility. Everyone has stories on Twitter or elsewhere of people making a early investment and getting fabulously wealthy. And the idea that this is accessible to all is very attractive. And so anything that is likely to accelerate that process or try and make it seem like crypto profits are easy inevitable and available are, are problematic for us. And so we really want to be careful with those. Yeah, I think the nature of the compensation, that's one thing people go, oh, well, obviously Kim Kardashian was being paid, 
But it's more than just saying, you know, slapping an ad, hashtag ad on there. You actually have to disclose the nature of the compensation that you're receiving, which no one ever does. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk next about market manipulation and I guess, I mean, some of the kind of fraudier sides, right? A lot of what we talk about and a lot of what we see lately is purely regulatory actions, but um, obviously like any segment of the market, there's fraud in this space. And I think, um, you know, one thing that I've observed is in the complaints that are, that are strictly regulatory or, or primarily regulatory like Coinbase and Binance, um, there's so much real estate in the complaints devoted to uh, traditional financial markets and the way that they operate and the checks and balances that are embedded into the securities laws and the rules and regulations that govern clearing houses, broker dealers, exchanges, and, and the idea that the, all of that is missing when it comes to most centralized exchanges. And so you know, I, I, my sense is that that's in there to one for probably for a couple of reasons. But, you know, I think that it's it's in part meant to underscore the need for those investor protection measures that we have found in, in traditional securities markets that, you know, help the SEC surveil and have generally worked over the years. <laughs> and when you, you kind of create this new asset class where they're entirely absent, it, I, I have to imagine you find that it makes your job a little bit harder, <laughs> right? There is not a, a cat. Audit, there's no audit trail for these. Um, there's not, you know, you're not getting necessarily the alerts that you would get if you saw suspicious activity in the securities market. So, I mean, can, I guess one, can you talk a little bit about the cases you've brought, but also just generally the importance of, of detecting and preventing that activity? Sure, absolutely. And so. I think of the registration provisions, particularly in crypto, although they are not uh, technically anti-fraud provisions, I think of them as tremendous tools to help us combat fraud. That to the extent that entities go to the trouble of building out the compliance functions necessary to get registered with us, to make the periodic and ad hoc reporting that they need to do in the event of material occurrences, the kind of discipline required to go through that process of, of registration is um, both really important and indicative of a mature organization with a focus on the special nature of securities investments, that we are something different than consumer products or otherwise. These are people's retirements and college funds and futures at stake, and that creates um, additional special responsibilities for the folks who are serving those, those investor communities. And when functions are uh, kind of collapsed into a single entity. So one of the things we talk a lot about in some of our complaints as to uh, intermediaries has to do with the fact that in traditional financial markets, the broker function is separate from the exchange function, is separate from the clearing agency function. And that's true both to draw the contrast to the things that aren't being done, but also those things, when they are separated out, create some natural checks and balances that are otherwise absent. So a broker is unlikely to want to route traffic to an untrustworthy exchange. That's going to be bad for the broker's business if their clients don't get good execution, don't get reliable execution, lose custody of their assets. Similarly, exchanges don't want to clear and settle through untrustworthy clearing agencies. It's going to be bad for their business. They're going to lose out. They're going to potentially take on liability. And the need to try and make sure that your counterparties are above board and functioning properly creates some additional scrutiny and uh, additional oversight um, that is absent when you collapse all those functions under one, under one roof. And so it's not that I think in traditional finance it's impossible to put all those functions under one roof. It's that it's inadvisable and, and potentially illegal. And that's why that traditionally we have those things separately registered. In the context of market manipulation, you're also exactly right in that we don't have a consolidated audit trail. There's no CAT. There is a blockchain, and there's often references publicly to the idea that the blockchain provides a level of transparency that's otherwise absent in traditional financial markets, because all of this information is public. You just go on a blockchain and look at it. That is, um, I think, at best half correct. So centralized exchanges. Um, typically just ingest and, and settle internally, or they settle in big blocks with other exchanges, but they're not putting your transactions out on the blockchain, and so there's no 
auditable, visible public trail to see what's happening in terms of the transactions occurring within a centralized exchange. And even for those transactions that do hit the blockchain, it is a robust record in that it is permanent and it's available and that anybody can see it, but it's also a relatively thin record in that all that you get from it is typically the time of transaction, the amount at issue, and two pseudonymous indicators of the sender and the receiver. And that, that is not enough for most investors or markets to be able to detect market manipulation and fraud. And so I think that was well highlighted in the uh, hydrogen case involving moonwalkers that we brought last year. And we created similar, prepared similar allegations in the Tron litigation, which is ongoing, so I can talk less about. But in the hydrogen case, there was a promoter who wanted to raise money, did not want to do an ICO, uh, and so created their own token and tried to then get that out into the market in a variety of ways, airdrops, paying compensation to employees, doing some other things, and then tried to raise money for the development of the project that didn't yet exist by selling those tokens out into the market, but found that whenever they would sell, they would crash the market because there wasn't really demand for it. And so it was instantly dilutive, not just for the developer, but for everybody else in that market. And they were making those sales at a time where they'd assured everybody, don't worry, we're not selling yet. So lots of problems there. Uh, but it was invisible uh, to investors. They couldn't necessarily know who was selling. The company decided they wanted to raise money and that this wasn't working, so they hired a market-making firm that basically just engaged in fraud, that just opened, exchange, opened accounts at a couple centralized exchanges and then began wash trading between those accounts and entering spoofed orders, so buy and sell interest that was canceled before executed. It would be impossible for investors to know that the activity they were seeing was pure wash trading because all they would see, even if they had advanced analytics that would allow them to see the blockchain and know what was happening, they would just see one big exchange transacting with another. There'd be no way to know that the same owner of those individual accounts at those big institutions was the same. And there's no blue sheeting or other kind of method to make that more immediately available to us. And as a result of this market making activity, the promoters of hydrogen were able to raise about two and a half million dollars by selling their tokens out to retail investors. And those retail investors thought all the activity they were seeing was indicative of a deep organic market and demand for a product that was going to be created when in fact it was just a Potemkin village created to try and give the impression of liquidity. And that could be more widespread. I anticipate that's not the only instance of that going on. <laughs> it's something that is a big priority for us as an agency. A challenging one, I'm sure. Um, we have just three minutes left, so we'll do, the unit is called the Crypto Assets and Cyber Unit, and before it was called that, it was just called the Cyber Unit, um, despite most of the work being in the crypto space. Um, but it is still your responsibility to oversee the cybersecurity cases. And I know you've worked a lot on this uh, before heading up the unit, too, especially in Commissioner Control's office. Um, do you want to talk us through the kind of the cybersecurity cases and, and where you all are putting your resources for, for the enforcement of the cybersecurity laws, including the new cybersecurity regs for issuers that were just adopted? Sure. I'll. Uh Two and a half minutes covered as much of that as I can. So uh, the Black Bowed case from, I think, January of this year, I think, is indicative of the work we have been doing successfully and plan to continue doing. That case involved a um, publicly traded company, an issuer that had a number of um, sensitive clients having to do with, I think, it was uh, in the business of helping nonprofits raise money. And so they had a lot of PII of investors and others. They suffered an incident and came out publicly and uh, made some representations about the scope of the incident and uh, the potential harm of it. And it turned out those representations were not entirely accurate. And so we brought an action and uh, had a settled enforcement action against them. And I think the case stands for the proposition that it is uh, very important that you have adequate uh, cybersecurity uh, internal processes and controls if you're an issuer, and that you have to make sure that the people who are doing the hard work of actually monitoring your systems and detecting problems and making determinations about materiality have an open line of communication to the people who are responsible for making public disclosures. Because a lot of the problems, we saw this in the, the first American financial case as well, 
is the technical people don't have access to the disclosure people, and so information gets disseminated out to investors that turns out not to be entirely accurate and creates yeah. problems for investors and problems for the entity when we come through with an enforcement action. I, yeah, I, that's one of the things that I counsel clients most about. It's like, look, you need to have a plan. It needs to include your information security personnel talking to your disclosure personnel, and then you need to actually follow that plan when you have an incident because you know, as anyone who works in that space knows, like when you're dealing with an incident, your head's on a swivel and you're trying to get your arms around the incident, you're dealing with local breach notification laws, federal securities laws, there's a lot to deal with. Um, and then I guess a, the one thing I'll add is that the, there are these new rules out, out that I think a lot of people are concerned about and wondering how the SEC is gonna go about enforcing them and, and you know, Obviously, you haven't brought any of those cases yet, but my sense is that it's really, it's really not that different from the way the unit has been enforcing the federal securities laws until now. You know, it's always been the SEC's view that material incidents need to be disclosed to investors and that it needs to be an accurate and adequate disclosure. And timely. And timely. <laughs> now we have a very specific time frame, four days. Uh, but my sense is that we're looking at enforcement that looks a lot like it looked before the new rules. Yeah, it's always facts and circumstances, but I, I don't have anything that would uh, contradict that view. <laughs> all right, I think that's all we have time for. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.